assume that we're in agreement that uh, we should waive the appointment requirement. States, and the issue is how, how do we how do we prevent that from happening? Um, and we we said, well, let's let's develop the baseline of products that that the dispensaries have to keep. Now, to get there, what, what I need to understand in order to be able to articulate to a recommendation of the board is when Shane's saying, well, focus on doing reserves for the the raw material or, or raw inventory or product. What what does that mean? 
Um, and so how, how does that break down? And then how, how do we develop a, a reserve from that? And then before we even get there, I mean, what, what I'd also like to know is from the other three license holders, if, if they would recommend the same same measures or if, they, if it's easier for those dispensaries to focus on product rather than the raw material. Uh, so, Meg or Jim, do you have contacts with, with the other license holders? Just so yeah. it doesn't need to be another formal um, appearance, but if, if you could just get some, maybe just interview them and get, and get some feedback, um, then we can work towards making that, that recommendation because that's, that's one of the big ones is just to develop be able to inform the board on, on what that's going to look like as far as if we're going to recommend reserve baselines for the raw inventory. Um, I just need to know what kind of what we're talking about and if everyone's on the same page with that. And hopefully there's, uh, you know, cooperative and, and willing as Shane is uh, to support the medical program in that regard. You know, if, if I were to understand the idea of the, the biomass reserve, uh, you know, basically, Flour, let's say it is 50-50, the demand, and flour is half of it, and there will be a supply of flour that would be the same for an adult use market. It would be the concentrate product that would be in slightly different formulations, I would think, or potentially a product that doesn't exist at all in the adult use market that would be at issue. And those would be made, my understanding, the, uh, what would be reserved would be distillates, oils, uh, frozen, you know, flour, plant material that can be processed into uh, the oils or distillates that are needed to make those concentrate-based products, those other good events. And, you know, so to me the question is, is there a, uh, uh, production capacity that would allow those products to freely uh, make it to the market in a way that's equal or better to what happens now, uh, which is decent, um, but you know has its ups and downs, which I, I think are understandable. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a question. Honestly, it's not. Besides the words, it's not much more than where we started. Uh, because it isn't an agreement to set the product aside. It's just basically saying we have the raw material to make it. And I I'm not sure whether they're promising the immediate production capacity to get those products made. I think that's being prioritized, but uh, again, it's sort of good faith. I think that we have to take that. And the last thing I'll say is that in the future, uh, when this starts up in the spring of 2022 or in January when the CCP takes over uh, the registry, you know, it's my uh, hope that there, the future oversight committee that exists and will work with the CCP will be in a position to, you know, work with the dispensary in a different way than we ever have been, you know, now. Be more informed and be able to step in and say, here, you know, here's what we see happening, what can you do? Uh, and again, you know, it seems better to proceed with constructive, uh, you know, optimism than to assume the worst, which uh, I, I would want to do, that it just, we won't be prioritized. Well, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I want to do what we can to, to try and protect the, the medical patients. Um, and certainly there will be a probationary period when they have a, we have a better um, understanding of what the demand looks like from the adult use market uh, and what you know what these dispensaries can sustain ultimately as far as their set asides or reserves for the, the medical patients. But the more we can the more we can recommend to make that protection, the, the better off the medical program is, is going to be ultimately. Um, if uh, I'm, I'm willing to listen more on that, but, but for now, you know, if, if we could get some input from the other license holders about that, I, I think that'd be helpful. Uh, the other thing I had in my notes that, that Shane was mentioning, and we don't have to tackle it now um, because I, I think it might be it might be more of a ultimately a compliance issue, but. Um, uh, I went ahead and, and said, hey, is there anything else that's not working? And what he seemed to say was more of an 
kind of an inventory issue on how things are 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 counted or, or stacked against you do you remember that part of the conversation well, what did what did you think of his, his suggestion there or did you know enough about that that issue because that was that was new to me and i wanted to at least bring it up raise it and see if we needed to deal with it or not I want to be sure I'm referring to the same issue you're bringing up now. So that was when Sheen was discussing, uh, rather than dividing medical and adult use from all the way from seat to sale exactly. up together until you get to the, essentially when you're creating actual products. Yeah. Right. Um, your guys' thoughts on that? I didn't. I wasn't as well informed on that um, at the time. I've, I've thought about it, but I don't know one or the other if his recommendation is, is prudent or not. So I wanted to to get your input. That that makes sense to me. It just gives them, as a business person, uh, more flexibility to apply product to either or. Um, without having to distinguish where it came from individually. Those were my feelings as well. I feel like in the interest of sustaining the medical program, you know, allowing kind of these efficiencies seems like the obvious choice to me. Um, I think determining that early on in the process, which is going to be medical or which is going to be adult use, could potentially um, you know, not be beneficial to medical, which is ultimately what we don't want. And what is I really would the agree. difference between? I was just saying, and what is really the difference between the two? How would you separate them out, and why would this be for one population and that for another? Um, right. Th th those are my questions. What is well more difficult for for Shane? I, I think at the. Um, to answer Matt's question, I think you really wouldn't separate them until you get to that product phase because that's only where you're gonna see the differences in the higher concentrations of THC um, or maybe some specifically formulated products. But other than that, I would agree, I don't see a w along the line where they would be different until that kind of final stage. Yeah. And that gives a flexibility if you have a whole bunch of one thing a little less of another and you can be, put them together for different concoctions. <laughs> I did just want to make one, one, just if we can go back just for a second, Tom, around the register to purchase. Um, and I'll just sort of say from the prevention perspective that um, to eliminate that would be increasing access to young adult population not really because there, it'll, it'll be sort of a, a uh, one hurdle that we may or may not reduce. So if access is a risk factor, which it is for any substance misuse, um, then that's the kind of place where like you don't want too many outlets around schools. You don't, you know, these types of questions of access. It's one of the primary um, ways to um, reduce misuse is by reducing access. I, I, so I'd like to put that in the notes, but at the same time recognize that most businesses don't have to register their clients, you know, before they, or their shoppers before they come in. Yeah. I mean, and, and if it is a, you know, if, if they're looking, if their product is medically safe, safe and their advice is right, then, you know, it's, it's, I just want to sort of make the point that access is a significant factor in prevention. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you. that's not the maybe that's a bottleneck sh for a short period, but not for a long period. And, and I mean, they're going to get through. They're going to register. They're going to purchase. So either way, they're going to purchase. But sometimes it's just going to be more less access. And I don't really see that really changing. But I just wanted to make that point. No, thank you. And I did want after we wrap up discussion of, of Shane, I, I didn't want to get to Jim and just the update from uh, the meeting they had last week that we didn't get to last Thursday. Um, and, and we can bring up those points uh, in, in a second, Matt. Sure. Uh, but Jim, did you have more to add on uh, that? I mean, yeah, what I, what I would say is, you know, I do think that, I absolutely agree, wherever the efficiencies that can 
you know, financially help the medical program stay strong, I think that's important to, to have the dispensaries have the ability to do that. The only, the only thing that I can see that, that could be a uh, difference uh, could be testing based. You know, uh, if the testing standard for adult use is the same from start to finish as it is for medical, then it won't matter. Uh, you know, if there are additional medical testing that's being done, um, you know, and also I would say this, that I hope uh, one of the things Shane talked about is uh, the number of strains available in a broad spectrum treatment, which is popular uh, in medical cannabis circles. And so there might be flour that uh, is specifically, you know, grown for medical reasons, either uh, because, you know, of its terpene profile or uh, the different kinds of THC versus the different, you know, types of CBD, CBN, all these different things. Uh, the, the profile might be different. And the one last thing I would say is there are cannabis uh, strains that are being bred that are incredibly high in THC. And some of those are being shown to have a certain, you know, uh, specific uh, profiles to them that could in the future prove to be effective in a medical program. So I would hate to set up a situation that doesn't allow for a higher THC flower than is allowed, uh, something like that. So uh, it's just to be the devil's advocate there. Yeah, understood. And, and so, yeah, the, there are going to be some challenges to in your crafting this, this baseline reserve that we, we, we keep discussing. Um, yeah, that's another issue. Okay, well, um, I think, are we in agreement that the seed to sale tracking um, should be generic uh, until whatever point in time uh, that it's gonna be processed? Uh, and at that point, um, they can make the distinction between medical and recreational. I would agree. Yes. I would agree. Okay. All right. I'll put that down on another head or a list of recommendations. Um, with respect to the testing, I don't know why it would be different. Well, uh, I mean, does anyone know of a reason why you, why you'd have distinct testing between the medical and the adult use products? Well, you might be testing for a lot of components in a medical product. Uh, you know, the number of uh, uh, chemical components, uh, types of THC, types of CBD, CBN, all, all these uh, uh, various components. My limited understanding of testing, admittedly, you know, shows uh, results where you get, you know, eight parameters, 10 parameters. Uh, and it's different, you know, different testing is different. And I could see potentially for medical, you might uh, be looking at more of the chemical profile that is necessary for adult use. Uh, that's the only reason I could think that the testing would be different, you know, and perhaps done to a different degree. By, by chemical profile, Jim, are you, are you talking about um, to check for the presence of different types of THC or CBD or CBN or yeah. for different pesticides just for safety for medical patients? Well, I would think the pesticides would be the same for anybody. What's safe is safe for consumption. But what would be unique to the medical patient would be the, the psychoactive, you know, chemical profile, the THCs, the CBDs, that, you know, for instance, when somebody says, uh, we heard, uh, I, I forget when, it might have been Jessalyn uh, Dolan said this about, you know, how, how uh, much she likes using a one-to-one -one CBD THC blend. Uh, you know, those are the kinds of things that we can't foresee as medical research begins on cannabis, what types of uh, testing we might need to see in terms I think I think a medical patient will be interested in seeing more than the adult use would need to 
And from a uh, prevention, oh. Oh, I was going to say from a prevention perspective, it, it would be more about the potency and the amount of THC um, being um, assessed and 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 in patients or others being informed of that, just so you don't get that youth who's had two joints or something and has no real um, resilience and then all of a sudden does like this massive THC level and then goes into a psychotic break. So the, it's really from a pre pre prevention perspective, it's mostly about like the measure of THC and potency and the transparency about what it is. But I think, Bob, in terms of the lab testing for contaminants, it, it's not going to be different between medical and adult use. But even with what, what Jim was saying, and, and I'll, we, we have a number of NACB members that are, are lab testing uh, facilities, so I'll, I'm going to check with them as well. But Jim, from what you were describing, just the ratios, one to one, CBD or THC, or Matt, what you were saying as far as potency, I mean, the testing is going to be, they're going to need to test for that regardless of its adult use or, or medical. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm saying that across the board. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out, and, and maybe, maybe Jim, it's the, if, if a certain medical patient is looking for, I don't know, um, maybe specific things across the spectrum that an adult use test wouldn't cover, but I, I think it still would, but I'll, I'll, I'll look into that a little more. That seems like a, a company, like product line question. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's really like, hey, we can offer you this type and that type, and we put it together, and you get this type. And you know, I think that 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 has um, that sort of you've already gotten to the place of your different primary components, and you're just sort of putting together mixes for the market, whether it be for the adult use or the medical. I mean, and the, the relevance is what you were getting to before, Jim. If there is different testing, then is that going to require yeah. different CD cell tracking than what Shane was recommending, right? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I don't know the answer, but I do know the question because as a consumer, yeah. I can go, I, I believe it's more than, it could be a product labeling. I think as Matt suggesting that it is, it, you know, uh, you could have a product label that is formulated, but it could be a flower as well uh, that somebody wants to vaporize or turn into a edible or something themselves. And it, it, you know, I think I'm getting into the fine details of this, but uh, my understanding is that you know you don't necessarily test for every single, you know, uh, you might have THC levels, but people aren't looking for THC A levels. You know, and it might not be necessary to to list that. So I'm just I, I, I I'm leaving open the possibility uh, in a way that allows for the most uh, efficacy of the cannabis for a medical patient. Understood. Jim, Jim go ahead. You, you your question. Hey. Um. So our lab testing um, protocols are that subcommittee should have um, some. Uh, decisions made relatively soon that maybe it'd be worth waiting to see what the adult rec side lab standards and testing protocols are going to be before we decide whether or not we need to go over and above that for the medical side. I think a question that I would like to have answered by this subcommittee is um, whether we're going to require third party testing for the medical dispensaries because they are going to be integrated license holders so they will have a testing license and whether they can test their own product or not should be, I think, uh, something that I'd like to see a recommendation on. Sure, I mean, my recommendation is third party. Um, Jim, Meg, Matt, did you have any other opinions? I, I guess uh, I was in a cannabis uh, conference recently and the one big thing from Colorado they said was, was get it state tested because it's it's the way that will be most consistent and it doesn't leave you leave you open to sort of wanting to uh alter the test not that that would happen but well we'll, we'll see what the lab testing subcommittee comes up with but I, I don't think there's a state testing lab that's 
gonna, that's going to be recommended. <laughs> right. No. Yeah, and I, I'm not yeah. sure why they were so emphatic about that, except for maybe there was some bad apples or that happened. I think the only concern with relying on third parties is simply a timing issue. Um, you know, if, if there's only a handful of third party labs in the state, um, I think I would be a little bit worried with how quickly they could turn around specifically medical product, um, but definitely open to exploring that. Uh, I, I would say that uh, on the, the Oversight Committee, we have seen uh, a lot of feedback on uh, the need for having third-party testing. And I'm saying that in as objective a way as I can. I don't actually, you know, look at the test results and I'm not sure, you know, there's a, a, a lot of things that have been said about how testing has been done. And the idea of whether, you know, uh, you can test yourself self-testing is, uh, you know, reliable. I would say there's a large group of at least vocal, a vocal group of medical patients who feel like you cannot have uh, testing that you do yourself. You need uh, a third party to do it, whether you're having another dispensary do it or, you know, a state lab or a private lab. Uh, I think that if that isn't the case, it's going to be a, always a uh, talk about issue ongoing. Yeah, uh, um, I, I think you're you're right, Meg. That's the big concern is the delay, and that's what you've seen across the cannabis and the hemp industries, frankly. Um, but I don't know. It seems to me just a fundamental issue. If you're testing your own stuff, there's that's a big inherent conflict. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know how you get around that. If it's even just for appearances, like you were saying, Jim, or just, I mean, I think you're asking for trouble. Um, so, I mean, even if it's from the perspective of, if you have the existing four or five license holders testing each other's product, uh, because if they're gonna all be integrated licenses, they, they should all be up and running with their own testing um, just as quickly as, they would for self-test, but have them test each other, but don't don't set it up for for that same testing would be my recommendation. Um, we don't have to take a vote on that now, but, but think about it, because I, I would like to take a vote on that in the, the, the next meeting. But that's a good segue. Uh, Jim, if you could, you sent me an email. You had a, was it last week that you had a meeting or the, or the, the week before? Um, uh, the update from, uh, uh, the registry or the sorry I'm trying to put up your pull up your email now which, which Jim a committee proposal the, are you talking about the oversight committee uh, proposal yeah. right so uh yeah, basically, uh, the update I can give you is that we are uh, at the point where uh, the Oversight Committee has uh, created a draft document that it is agreed upon, uh, the, the board members, and we have posted it and put it out for a public comment period uh, that will end next Wednesday uh, with a meeting where my intention is for it to be uh, mostly public comment uh, for that next board meeting. And uh, we have passed uh, the document along to all the various stakeholders. Uh, you know, I think that uh, Bryn uh, just, you know, uh, said back to me that it seemed like we're on schedule to be able to review this in our subcommittee uh, and then pass it through in time for the board to uh, be able to make their recommendation on time to the legislature. Uh, um, you know, so I would imagine besides the public comment we'll get, uh, there'll be a, you know, some uh, decent amount of discussion in our subcommittee uh, as well. And uh, so that's the document I forwarded to everybody and, and uh, we can begin a discussion of that at, at any point. Yeah, you, you just want to give us the, um... Can you give us the, the highlight of uh, what, what the, how the committee's comprised? 
Does it help if I be next to me? Does it help if I screen share it? Would that help you, Jim? Sure, that would be great. I mean, it's going to take me one second otherwise uh, to to uh, pull it up. Actually, the easiest way for me to do it will be uh, from the document I sent you guys. Yeah, I've got it here. Um, so three year terms beginning in February? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and this is all based on uh, uh, the current uh, statute as it exists. And the primary uh, changes have really uh, gone into the this first paragraph, really, where uh, we talk about the establishment of the committee, uh, you know, it's getting much more of a definition here uh, than it did at the past. In the past, you know, we're uh, we're recommending here that not only it have a uh, more of a physical location, but a strong uh, digital presence that will uh, basically. Uh, create a, uh, an ongoing uh, back and forth capability uh, between the public, the oversight committee, and the cannabis control board. Um, we've recommended uh, in here as well for a, a budget uh, for oversight, which we have not had in the past. Uh, you know, and I think the desire there is to uh, really beef up and strongly be able to. Uh, take on the role of advising the Cannabis Control Board as much as possible. So we want to be in a position uh, to have a committee in the future that can spend the money to bring in witnesses, uh, do research surveys uh, when necessary. Um, and then we did not have term limits actually uh, prior uh, to this recommendation. So, uh, you know, that was something that uh, was unanimously agreed upon. Uh, by the by the, the current board members uh, and we you know at this point the uh, Department of Public Safety has been the oversight board's home and has, has given us uh, uh, our administrative support uh, so to speak and uh, this is uh, imagining assuming that the uh, cannabis control board will do this in the future and then the, the makeup of the committee is really quite different uh, than it was in the past. The committee in the past had uh, members appointed from each of the different dispensaries and with really no instruction other than they be appointed. Uh, there really was not any guidance in the rules at all about uh, what they were going to do or how long they would be there. And then a decent amount of the board were uh, members that were really, uh, I would say, from a different time period. Uh, the Oversight Committee was created in part, uh, my understanding is in response to uh, the Cole Memo uh, during the Obama administration. And it gives uh, uh, seats on the Oversight Committee uh, to the leagues of city and, uh, League of Cities and Towns, uh, the uh, Chief of Police Association, Sheriff's Association. Uh, there was a lot of focus, uh, to be frank, uh, on protecting the public from the medical program, which I think really speaks more to what the time was. Uh, and so we've, we've made a recommendation that uh, this board is going to primarily be made up of uh, patients. And I know that, that a lot of the language we put in here in terms of uh, chosen by lottery and randomly and whatnot uh, is, is going to be, you know, I think heavily debated how we do this. Um, but we very consciously debated and decided that, uh, you know, it would be best to uh, base these uh, uh, registered patients out of the registry itself. Uh, same uh, for the caregivers. 
uh, rather than recommended by a dispensary, uh, this seems like it randomizes it a bit more, which was a concern a lot of the board members had. Um, we also wanted to make sure that there are healthcare professionals on the board so that we can be researching and advising uh, on the healthcare science and uh, medical matters as well. And uh, I've tried to put in a broad definition of, of uh, the types of people that you know could be in there. It could be doctors, nurse practitioners, uh, uh, naturopaths, uh, osteopaths. Uh, you know, we really tried to not define it uh, because there are so many uh, healthcare practitioners. I think that uh, would be suitable to recommend patients to the program and understand also the use of cannabis uh, as a medicine. And then uh, this, the next item we have in there was pretty hotly debated on whether or not to have a uh, cultivator uh, on the committee. That has not been the case in the past. And uh, I think this discussion went hand in hand with the questions uh, about caregivers being cultivators and the board in part being very concerned that we separate the idea of at least a professional cultivating on a broad scale from uh, being a designated grower for a medical patient. And uh, I think those issues, we've moved them forward quite a bit. But the idea, uh, we did get just barely a, a, a positive vote on a cultivator. There were board members opposed to this and who just couldn't see why you would have uh, why, uh, a cultivator uh, talking about medical cannabis. But I think a, a really a large, uh, you know, the, the other group felt pretty strongly that, uh, you know, this is a plant-based medicine and uh, at this point, especially where the science and research is limited, that uh, the cultivators definitely offer uh, a lot of the connection and insight uh, to the plant itself. And I think it's also a good balance uh, to the dispensary being the only provider of the medicine itself and, and getting another voice in there. So uh, we did decide to uh, go ahead and make that recommendation. Uh, that we include a, a grower in there, and uh, and you got that is, public safety. Uh, yeah, the well, you know, uh, we we have it in there that that uh, we were going to, uh, you know, yeah, this was this was debated to a certain degree. We we. There was a, a vote about leaving public safety in medical, but it, it really seems like it's being covered elsewhere, you know, in the adult use program, and that the the burden of uh, safety, you know, is primarily going to fall uh, at least public safety uh, just in a broader umbrella that I we didn't feel like it needed to be specifically addressed within the medical oversight itself. So in the end, uh, we had talked about a transitional period uh, to have a member from the Department of Public Safety uh, sitting on the board, but that was really less from a public safety perspective than a uh, you know uh, sort of bureaucratic perspective. The, the, the Department of Public Safety has been uh, running the, the program, and we felt there was a lot of uh, knowledge and experience there uh, that might benefit uh, the uh, oversight, but you know, we also discussed that and felt like it's going to occur uh, naturally between the Cannabis Control Board and the Department of Public Safety, and so it wasn't necessary to build that in uh, to the to the committee itself. Um, we in the past, the the oversight committee only really was obligated to meet once uh, a year. And it was really for the purpose of uh, putting together a uh, report to get to the legislature uh, to try to incrementally change the, the laws as necessary. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I don't think that that was enough. The, the Oversight Committee was not really 
uh, set up in a way that allowed for ongoing uh, oversight issues to be looked at, you know, other than what might be reported to the Department of Public Safety and the registry. Um, so, you know, given that there is going to be an ongoing supportive relationship, uh, advisor relationship with the Cannabis Control Board, uh, we, we debated four to six times a year and uh, ended up leaving it in as uh, six times a year uh, for meetings. And then I would imagine, you know, we're looking to have a coordinator uh, in an ongoing way that will keep uh, communication with the public and the dispensaries and Cannabis Control Board ongoing, uh, which is really, I think, necessary for the, for the medical program. Yeah. And that is uh, the, the recommendation. You know, we have uh, rules that govern uh, the committee that are basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, performa type rules that are not uh, specific to uh, medical cannabis uh, specifically. And so we didn't really address those, you know, it's uh, uh, Robert Rules Plus kind of thing. Um, this was the main uh, part of the statute. The other parts of the statute that existed really were what set up the, uh, uh, the, the, the registry within the Department of Public Safety, and that was something we didn't need to address since for uh, either. Great. So there you have it. Thank you, Jim. And so you're welcome. back to your earlier point from a prevention perspective, even, even though it might be somewhat academic, but the, the registry isn't, isn't going anywhere. Um, so it, it sounds like, Jim, this this committee will be set up um, and it'll be under the auspices of one of the, the CCB members and they will meet with the CCB six times a, a year at least, uh, really to see how how good of a job we did setting up whatever recommendations we can give to the, the board and how they're continuing uh, the medical program. So um, that's good to see. I'm, I'm glad it is actually six times a year. But, but what, I would, what I would say is that, I, you know, I think that it isn't completely clear from how the wording is in this proposed draft statute in terms of whether it's meeting with the Cannabis Control Board six times a year or the Oversight Committee is. And I think the reporting function of how uh, the Cannabis Control Board hears from the Oversight Committee, uh, whereas it didn't get debated much in the, in the, through the board, my understanding was that it, the way the uh, Advisory Committee is structured, because you're gonna ha have the Chairman of the Oversight Committee uh, work in the Cannabis Control Board's advisory committee, you will have the, a natural uh, influx of information, you know, uh, coming through in that way. But I think also, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, ongoing concerns that people have about the medical program, which, uh, you know, I think patients would like to be, know that they're being expressed more frequently. I think the mechanism for getting those uh, to the CCB will be, uh, I think more, you know, a bureaucratic within the offices, but perhaps it needs to be written into this uh, uh, statute. Very good. Uh, other than the manner in, in which the meetings will take place, what other issues do, does this subcommittee need to, to take into account from the draft proposal, do you think? Well, uh, you know, I really do think the, the main issues are going to be budgetary, you know, how much the Cannabis Control Board uh, is able to uh, get in terms of being able to fund this or uh, how, how that will work. And I think the makeup of the members themselves uh, will be, you know, uh, I think are dislocating. Again, my apologies. My dog hears me talking and makes it dinner time always. And uh, I think that also the mechanism of appointment, you know, uh, this is the, the, the oversight committee felt pretty strongly that uh, this was 
the mechanisms we recommend out of a lottery in some places and then selected by the cannabis control board you know i would imagine those uh, are worth looking at as well in a practical way to, to uh with input from uh from chairman pepper and other board members as to what's practical uh and makes sense uh, we decided not to include the governor or the legislature in uh, picking, you know, any of these oversight members because there really was no expertise uh, in any of those areas. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, over, the controlling bodies for the oversight committee will have been, you know, uh, picked and reviewed by the legislature governor. So I think that, you know, we should touch on all those issues, whether people agree on the makeup, uh, you know, uh, I think, you know, we can make some changes uh, if necessary, should the, the CPD feel, you know, they want the mechanism to be different, uh, if that matters in our recommendation. Sure, and, and I'll comment that on in a second. Um, Jim, I just wanted to see if we had public comments. No, no public comment in the room. Okay. Um, and, and I want to hear from, from Meg, Matt, and, and Jim, and or Bryn, but um, I don't, uh, the, the makeup of the committee, at least, uh, from the three items I have to look at, so how, how to meet with the board, the budget, and the, the appointment committee, it, it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I like that there's a um, the majority of, of caregivers. Um, I don't mind uh, a representative from, from the VGA. I don't mind you know the exclusion of the public safety or the legislator or the governor. But um, and I, I don't mind the, the lottery selection process either. Uh, those are my initial impressions. Meg or Matt, did you have any items for discussion at least on the makeup of the committee right now? Uh, we we can discuss it more in the next meeting. But th those are my thoughts when I when I looked at it when you sent it, Jim. Oh, I think you're muted. You want to go first, please? Uh, sure. 